10,000 christenings since every year. Using this smallest statistic, Grant began to make some inferences. Grant reasoned that if there were 10,000 christenings, this would be closely related to the number of births. The number of births relates to the number of women of childbearing age. The number of women relates to the number of families and their size. Through his calculation, Grant determined that English population wasn't two million, but rather one-fifth that size, or 384,000. Most experts today believe Grant's estimate was very close to the true numbers. By drawing conclusions from data, Grant began modern statistical analysis. Back at Sec Taylor Stadium, manager Ron Clark is faced with his own set of numbers to consider. It's late in the game, the bottom of the sixth inning, and Clark's team is behind two runs to one. Clark's first batter gets on base. With no outs, and the tying run on first base, Clark needs to develop a strategy to advance the runner. He considers a sacrifice bunt. In a sacrifice bunt, the batter bunts the ball in front of the plate. The batter will probably be thrown out as the sacrifice. The bunt, however, enables the runner to advance. On the surface, this looks like a good choice. However, Clark considers several other statistics. On the mound is pitcher Steve Olson. One of Olson's small s statistics is very telling. He has a high earn run average of 4.57, which means he gives away an average of more than four runs per game. Batting next against Olsen is outfielder Brooks Kiesnick, who has a good batting average. As does third baseman, Matt Franco, who is on deck. With two batters coming up with good batting averages against a pitcher who gives away a lot of runs, Clark makes a decision and signals his batter. In this case, Clark's decision pays off. The time run has advanced without sacrificing it out. Baseball managers, I think, have a very difficult job. Deciding whether to bunt or who to play on a particular day depends on the manager's decision. The decision-making is hard because you don't know what's going to happen. And you're making decisions based on what are going to give you the best chance of success. On this day, Clark's strategy for the Iowa Cubs works. And they win 6-5. to A victory built on athletics and statistics. Big part.
part of all the games that we play. And when it comes to games and chance, casino owners are banking on the numbers. Billions of dollars are generated every year by the gaming industry. And much of that fortune relies on a part of statistics called probability theory. Probability theory is a system to look into the future. If you want to look into something that's going to happen tomorrow or next week, there could be a whole range of things that's going to happen. What probability theory lets you do is say, this is most likely to happen, that that thing's most likely to happen, or that thing's most likely to happen. It allows you to take a whole range of possibilities and narrow them down. The mathematics of probability was actually developed as a way to understand games of chance. Look just beyond the glitter and the lights and you'll see mathematics. Edward Packle knows all about probability and the games of chance. One of my administrators did ask me many years ago what uh, gambling had to do with mathematics in, in the sense that I was proposing to teach a course on the mathematics of games and gambling. And uh, after discussing with them the historical importance of gambling as a source of the original ideas, or many of the original ideas of probability theory, they were convinced that it had a lot to do with probability and mathematics and logical thinking. Since ancient times, we've been trying our luck at games of chance. In fact, some of the first dice were actually made from the ankle bones of animals. For centuries, luck was the name of the game. Nobody was understood to have an edge. But then in the 17th century, two mathematicians changed everything. Blaise Pascal and Pierre de Fermat were two of the most famous mathematicians of the 17th century. Pascal had a colleague who was a keen gambler. The gambler came to Pascal and said he wanted to know uh, the answer to a certain question about probabilities to do with playing gambling games. The problem that piqued Pascal and Fermat's interest revolved around a game of dice that comes to an untimely end. Suppose two people are playing a game they're gambling with each other, and halfway through the game, they have to abandon it. One person is ahead of the other person at that stage. Question, how do they divide the pot so that it's fair to both? Now, if you think about it, that means you have to look into the future, the potential future that would have happened had they been able to complete the game. In a series of letters, Pascal and Fermat imagined a game of dice to be played in five rounds. The first person to win three rounds wins the game. 